<laughs> okay, guys. So, welcome to week two of summer core lecture series. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Sean Greenhall. He's one of our hospital series. We'll be giving you guys electronic ethic language. All right, a senior. No, just no. That's fine. Okay. Hey, guys. Um, <laughs> I was telling Magda in true Loyola fashion, the ER called me with an admission of a patient that was on two pressors and intubated that they extubated and turned the pressors off. And I was like, are they going to make it an hour? Cause I have to teach. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, probably. I was like, okay, because I have to teach. And just as I walk in, I get a page, she's expired. I'm like, you guys have to pronounce her. I can't come down. Come on. I haven't even seen her. So if you haven't experienced that, you will at some point. Um, so yeah, I'm Sean Greenhall. I'm one of the hospitalists. It would not be incorrect to say that I am the hospitalist, which is how I told Magda to introduce me. So I'm the division director for hospital medicine here at Loyola. And then by the two greatest words in English language, default, I am the regional medical director of hospital medicine at Loyola Gottlieb and McNeil too. So inevitably, when you decide to be a hospitalist, talk to me because I can help. Um, and you will work with a lot of my friends um, throughout the year, and we are all very excited uh, to work with you. We do draw straws to see who has to be on teaching service in July. Um, and since I make the schedule, I don't have to do it this year. <laughs> but I, I did do it two years ago, and the memories are still fresh. Um, all right, so uh, it was a really fun, and I think it, it would be a difficult title or message for me to live up to what. Uh, what was sent out about um, Kumada and it sounded very romantic and fun. I, <laughs> I don't think I can live up to that, but I'll do my best. Um, if at any point you guys have questions, you know, stop and ask. Um, this is meant to be interactive um, and very non-threatening. All right, so anticoagulation. I don't know, Magda, this thing's already not happy. No, 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 you said to click something, move it around, click. towards the thing <laughs> can i just use the mouse all right there we go okay all right so again this is meant to be a very basic lecture so for any of the seniors listening in you have probably seen this already so we talk about why are we anticoagulating somebody so let's just talk about atrial fibrillation so it's 15 percent um of 50% of all strokes in all persons, and vitamin K antagonists, and forever known in the United States as warfarin, uh, effectively prevent stroke in non-valvular aphids. And I apologize, I'm gonna kind of turn and back up a little bit since I don't have slides to look at. Um, we also put people on Coumadin for venous thromboembolism. Where are you on? You can flip them over. That'd be awesome, perfect. Okay, so it's another reason people are on Coumadin. So 60,000 annual ER visits for hemorrhagic complications in patients taking BKAs, again, Coumadin. 42,000 hospitalizations yearly for bleeding of supertherapeutic INRs in the US. Intracranial hemorrhage is responsible for the majority of disability and death associated with anticoagulation. All that being said, this is me being funny, so laugh, damn it. It's not rocket surgery. Uh, they, never mind. I had this whole debate about taking that slide. <laughs> I was too lazy. I know, but it's like first day on service. I got another meme later that I think still carries through. All right, so the most important thing here, I, I can't stress how important the clotting cascade is not. Like you're not a medical student anymore. I don't care. If we're rounding together and you start talking to me about factors, I will probably start crying and walk away. It doesn't matter. We're not interested in that. This is, this is purely how can we use this stuff, right? Um, at some point, you'll do hematology. They probably want you to know this stuff. And some of you may, God forbid, want to be hematologists, and then you probably do need to know it. So we don't care. We're not, we're not going to deal with that. So let's start with Coumadin, okay? Coumadin is something that my generation, this was the anticoagulant. Everybody was on Coumadin. Coumadin is pretty neat. I wanted you to actually see, in case you don't see it, this is what Coumadin pills look like, right? They're all the same size, but notice the number is written on it and they're different colors. That's kind of cool. 
and patients will still screw it up. But when the patient says, I take a pill and it's a number six, you have some idea what it is. Versus, and this, it hasn't happened to you yet, it will, when the patient says, I don't know, it's the, the white pill, the, the round one. You're like, helpful, thank you. But this is actually helpful. Okay, so some fun facts about Coumadin. Show of hands, who knows the story of Coumadin? All right, then you have to be quiet. But nobody else knows, right? All right, good. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Note, if an attending says that, the answer is no, don't correct the attending, <laughs> right? Okay, so in the 1920s, there was an outbreak of previously unrecognized cattle disease. Cows were being gelded and they were hemorrhaging to death after minor procedures. Cows shouldn't bleed to death after something like that. They ingested spoiled sweet clover that was growing at the edge of the field. So the substance was called, uh, they discovered an anticoagulant called dicumerol, and it was discovered at the University of Wisconsin, which is also the same chemical that makes the cut grass smell. So when you're mowing the lawn, that's the smell. Um, so University of Wisconsin researchers. So this is how we get the name Warfarin. So Warf is Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Warf. And then the Arin comes from the term Coumarin, which is another name for the compound. So when people will tell you Coumadin is rat poison, it is rat poison. And I actually had a wife that was poisoning her husband with it once when I was an intern. Okay, it began first as a pesticide in 1948 and was first used as an anticoagulant in 1954. They actually discovered that it could be used in people because a Navy midshipman who was trying to use it as rat poison actually ingested it in a suicide attempt and they found that it had thinned the blood. Does anybody know the name of the first president that was on it for strokes? It was Dwight D. Eisenhower. Okay, so now we get into the new classes of drugs out there, the DOACs. And this, you know, 10 years ago was like, ooh, DOACs. What did we call them before they were called DOACs? Before they were direct, what were they? NOACs. And what was the N? Novel. 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 So here's an interesting way you can get a paper published about anything. They published a paper comparing novel or NOAC versus direct or DOAC. And they found that if you called them DOACs, people were more likely to prescribe them because old people and old doctors don't like anything novel. So if you called it novel, they thought, uh oh, they're experimenting on me. If you called it direct, they're like, yeah, awesome, better than indirect. So a direct Oral anticoagulant or DOAC. Sometimes you will still see them called NOACs. Those people are wrong. All right, so there's a couple of different kinds out there. We're really only going to deal with the pills here because everybody every once in a while throws out, oh, yeah, your van. Who cares? We're not going to talk about it. So the first one is a direct thrombin inhibitor, the DTI, and that's dibigatran or Pradaxa. That was actually came out when I was a senior resident. Everybody got really hot for it. And everybody was on Dibigatran, but you won't see a whole lot of people on it these days. It's the sort of drug now where you're like, Dibigatran, ah, that's fun, but you don't use it a lot. Um, the next ones that came out were Rivaroxaban and Apixaban. And then there's a couple more that have come out after, Adoxaban and Batrixaban. Now, I put the scientific name and the trade names on there because it's important for you guys to know what's what. Really, when you're writing your notes, you should call it a pick span. You should call it River Rock span. I really bothers me when people write Zivrelto, when people write Eloquist. It's important to know, though, because not at Loyola, but someday when you're all grown ups and you're out in your own offices, these beautiful people will come in and they'll have trays of chicken parmesan and they'll set it down in front of you and they will tell you about the evils of one of the drugs and how good the one drug that they're representing is. And they're called drug reps. And yes, they are the devil, but they have chicken parm and you'll do whatever they say. So River Roxban is Zarelto, uh, Apixaban is Eloquus. Adoxaban, I always said, it sounds, it's, it's like an angry German yelling at you, Savisa, right? Batrixaban is just Bevixa. And there was an old ID doc here that used to tell us about how they actually settle on these trade names. And he said, it's always X's and Z's because he said they were zexier. But you'll see almost all of these trade names have like X's and Z's thrown in them to make them kind of fun to say. So let's talk about Batrixaban before we talk about the others. This is actually the newest one on the market. Um, it is actually now approved for extended thromboprophylaxis. So in people that you want to put them on um, a, an anticoagulant, but not a full dose one, you can put them on something called Bevixa. It's not going to fully anticoagulate. We can't use it to treat 
anything, but we can use it to prevent further clots. So it's not a treatment option, but it is a prophylaxis option. Um, I myself have never seen it or used it, but I hear it's out there. So if you guys see it, let me know, I'm interested. So let's go through our different anticoagulants, right? Coumadin, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban. We are gonna forget Bivixa at this point, all right? So we look at half-life renal clearance interactions and reversal agent. So half-life, 40 hours for Coumadin and less for the others. This comes into play when we're talking about how long we have to hold these drugs before we can do surgery. So Coumadin, for the most part, you're gonna hold it for about five days, right? If they've been on it, more recently than that, there's a good chance that one of the levels is going to be elevated and you're going to have to fix it. For Dabiga, Riva, Apixa, Adoxa, in general, it's eh, two days if it's a non-major procedure, and you may even go three days if it's a major procedure. So it kind of depends, you know, when they break their hip on Apixaban, when did they take their last dose? And it's not something where we're going to reverse it. So you'll get these people in the hospital that are in traction because they have femur fractures, but they took their Apixaban on Monday they are probably not going to go to the OR until Thursday. We're not going to give them something to make it easier. Um, we're just going to stare at them. They are very unhappy sitting there in traction. So what about renal clearance? Is it cleared through the kidneys? So Coumadin is none. So even as much as five years ago, if you were on dialysis or had any amount of renal failure, you were on Coumadin. There was nothing else. We weren't going to use anything else, right? And especially because dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and adoxaban are fairly heavily renally cleared. So we are not going to use those guys in renal failure. But apixaban is actually okay. And one of the times, much like using lactated ringers, one of the times we owe an apology to surgeons. Surgeons were willing to use apixaban before medicine doctors were. And in general, don't do what surgeons do. But lactated ringers, they're right. And apixaban, they were right. You can use a Pixaban in renal failure. You can use a Pixaban in dialysis patients. Some people get nervous about it. It's acceptable. You dose reduce it. Um, so we finally do have an oral anticoagulant that's not Coumadin that is safe to use in dialysis. That's a big deal. You guys aren't going to live in a world where we're sitting there with what we call Coumadin hostages. Right? Coumadin hostages is somebody that has to be on Coumadin. So they have to sit here in the hospital for 10 days while you're bridging with heparin or Lovenox. Well, heparin in this case because you can't use Lovenox in the renal failure patients, right? So they're sitting here for 10 days. And day one, we're all on the same page. We're on the same team. We all get along. Day eight, they don't want to look at you. Just say the number. What's the number? 1.9, get out. They don't want to talk to you. Come in when it's over two, right? You're not going to have to deal with that as much because you have a pick span now. So what does it interact with? So Coumadin, one word. Coumadin interacts with everything, right? Your patient all of a sudden goes on a strictly kale diet. Coumadin interacts with green leafy vegetables. They love cranberry juice. Coumadin actually interacts with cranberry juice. Did you know that there's vitamin K in mayonnaise? You can't eat a ton of mayonnaise on Coumadin. I mean, if you go to anywhere south of Illinois, it's mayonnaise on everything. All right, what about the bigger trend and the rest of them? Do they have interactions? Yes. Do we care? No, that's why we have pharmacists, right? Do what I did. Marry a pharmacist. She has always corrected me. <laughs> To the point that even when I would come home and tell her about my day and the patients I took care of, she would describe what I did wrong. <laughs> so now we don't talk medicine anymore. And she's been promoted like 19 times, so she doesn't remember anything either. But yes, there are interactions with the DOAX. Are they major? Not so much. Remember, all of your ciprofloxacins and your macrolide, everything interacts with Coumadin. Not so much with your antibiotics. You can get away with most antibiotics. Some of the anti-seizure meds you have to worry about uh, the anti-epileptics, but, but not, um, not much of anything. Now, the big question is reversal agent. And this, again, up until a couple of years ago, this was kind of a big deal. Coumadin has some beautiful reversal agents. The rest of them, eh, it's questionable. And even now when I'm going to tell you that, yes, there are reversal agents, and no, you cannot use them. So can we reverse Coumadin? Yes. What do we use? Vitamin K, that's one. What else? Yeah, right? I think I heard plasma. So FFP, cryoprecipitate, things like that. And then vitamin K, beautiful reversal agents for Coumadin. Again, up until a couple of years ago, if I'd asked you, can you reverse the DOAC? The answer was no. And then very slowly things have started coming out. So now we, we have something called Praxbind, which will take care of dabigatran. And then there's adnexanet alpha, adnexanet alpha, A-L-F-A. 
like a dog food or something. Alpha. That is the reversal agent for the uh, anti-thrombin um, or the anti-10A inhibitors is N next to net alpha. We do have it at Loyola. You can't order it. No one in this room can order it. I can't order it, right? This is stuff that is only available through neurosurgery or the ER, because the ER said if neurosurgery should be allowed to do it, then we should be allowed to do it too. So these are the guys that can order stuff like that. We can. Okay, so you put somebody on Coumadin. When is it effective? When do these drugs work? It's very different for all of them, right? Coumadin takes a few days. Put somebody on Coumadin. You, if you need to bridge them, you're going to have to give them Lovenox. You're going to have to give them heparin. It's going to be a few days until that Coumadin level, that INR, is high enough to be therapeutic. But dibigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and doxaban, for all intents and purposes, work right away. Now, dibigatran and rivaroxaban, they'll still tell you you should do like five days of something else until they're working. But apixaban and adoxaban, those, those work right away. So I am not sponsored by a drug company, but I will say apixaban is my favorite. And the weird Apixaban guy that lurks downstairs near the coffee shop knows my name and talks about coming to my office. And I don't really have an office for him to come to. Um, but Apixaban will work right away. So you're going to find, as we go through this discussion, Apixaban is kind of the winner here, right? Because we can, it works right away. We can use it in kidney failure. Can I use it in renal failure? Yes, we kind of went over this. Can I measure it? No. Coumadin, yes. So remember, Coumadin, we have the INR. It's pretty good. Right? We know the level of the INR is associated with how bleedy you are. Bleedy is a word I invented. Right? If your INR is 8, you're very bleedy. If it's 16, you're probably already bleeding. Dibigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and doxaban. If you check INRs, if you check PTTs, there's even other things that you've never heard of that we don't check that they use in, in journals. And the part of journals that we don't read, not the discussion part or the beginning part, but that middle part you know, where they talk about how they did things. Things called like Ekerin clotting time and stuff like that. Even those don't accurately measure how anticoagulated you are on a DOAC. So could your PT or PTT go up on one of these things? Yes. Does it mean anything? Not really. It means you're probably taking it. But if your PTT or your INR goes up because you're on a PIXBAN, frankly, we see it a lot in people that are on these drugs, especially a PIXBAN, and are dehydrated. Their INRs go up, right? But it doesn't mean that much. It's certainly not, it's not comparable to warfarin. So we have no meaningful measure for it. Now, does that matter? Yes and no. If you're a patient and you can measure your INR, I guess that's nice, but what do you have to do to measure an INR? Yeah, I get your blood drawn. Can I just do that anywhere? No, I gotta go somewhere. Or I have to have somebody come to your house. Not only do I have to do it, but I have to have the physical infrastructure of a building or a car. I have to have needles. I have to have the lab equipment. Beyond that, I have to have somebody to take that number and do something with it. They have to call you or the nurse has to call you or the nurse has to call the doctor and the doctor has to call you. So there's a lot more that goes into measuring Coumadin than just checking an INR. There's a lot of physical infrastructure to it. So it's annoying for the patients too, right? Because they have to go a couple times a week uh, initially and then sometimes once a week and then maybe every other week. Now, as a doctor, it's kind of cool. I know when somebody comes in, they're on Coumadin, I know how anticoagulated they are, right? Versus Dabiga and Riva and the rest of them, I don't have a really good measurement for them. But if I'm a patient and I just know it works, I'm thrilled, right? And as a doctor, you just kind of have to assume that they're very bleedy and treat appropriately. So what about cost, right? Is Coumadin cheap or expensive? It's pretty cheap. What about the other guys? Yeah, more expensive anyway. If you were to look on a pill-to-pill -pill basis, these other guys are more expensive. But when you take into account all the other stuff I just talked about, the physical infrastructure needed to make Coumadin feasible, then you mix in all the sequelae of being on Coumadin, either your number being too low, thus you get clotting, or your number being too high and you're very bleedy and you end up in the hospital for it, and you have to miss work. When they actually do these cost-benefit ratios and analyses that, again, way above anything we're going to deal with, they actually find that they're pretty equal, right? Coumadin as a pill is cheaper, but Coumadin as something you're going to be on long-term is not really any cheaper than being on a Pixaban. So it's become easier to get these things covered. 
I date myself when I say this, but I came from a time when we had to get prior approval to get people home on Lovenox. Getting Lovenox was a real pain in the butt. Sometimes it can be annoying to get one of these drugs, but it's worth it in the end. So there's a bunch of trials out there that compare all the different DOACs. And again, there's going to be a beautiful person with chicken parm in front of you discussing this. Okay. And they're going to try and tell you that if you look at the different CHAD scores, if you look at the different outcome numbers, this drug is better than the other drug. And in reality, we all think actually that in the end, they're about all the same. One of the things to note in the different trials, the RELY trials, the ROCKET AF, the Aristotle trial, and the ENGAGE trial, is that there is a slight difference in the CHADS 2 score. This is pre-CHADS VASC when all this came out. And you can see here, CHADS 2 score of 3.48 in the ROCKET AF. So there is actually some more bleeding and some other issues in this trial that aren't present in uh, the other three trials. And there's a thought here that probably the people that were in the River Oxman trial were slightly sicker than the people in the other trials. So stuff that you might notice or stuff that they might talk to you about when they're trying to ply you with food and goodies. So if we look at the efficacy of the trials, we look at percent strokes per year and all these different drugs. And these are the ones that are available on the market. You can see by and large, your efficacy is gonna be about the same. Now, again, they had River Oxman is having more strokes per year than the other ones. But if you looked at the CHADS2 score being slightly higher, they were probably more likely to have strokes anyway. So what this boils down to is all these drugs work. Use something. Coumadin. When I was a resident, and especially when DOACs first came out, you had to have a good reason to put somebody on a DOAC, right? I would say the argument to you now, I propose to you, you have to have a good reason to put somebody on Coumadin. If you're going to put them on Coumadin, justify it, because otherwise you should put them on something else, right? So we look at major bleeding. How much are they bleeding per year? So again, Coumadin here, 3.09 to 3.43. We'll call it 3 to 3.5, right? All the others are about equal. In general, when they did statistical analyses, they would break it down. They would say, this is equal. They would say, all of these are equal to Coumadin in terms of bleeding. None of them are better. Now, they did a secondary analysis in a Pixaban. They actually said a Pixaban trended towards having less bleeding than Coumadin. And this was 10 plus years ago when these things came out, right? Now, we actually have better data now that I think I'm going to break down in a minute. Um, going through some of the major bleeding and why we're going to use DOAX over Coumadin. Um, this is interesting. This is actually a number, again, it's in that portion of the study that we don't always read. When you think about Coumadin, when you think about sending somebody home on Coumadin, and you just type in the little anti-coag referral order, think about these trials. These trials were multinational, hundreds of hospitals, many, many thousands of people with millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars behind these studies, right? So these were double blind, double dummy studies when they were studying a Pixaban, a River Oxban, and all these guys, right? What they did is they took every patient and they pretended you were on both. Some people got sugar warfarin and a real DOAC, right? Some people got warfarin and sort of a sugar DOAC. Whether you were on sugar warfarin or real warfarin, they still brought you into the Coumadin clinic. They either give you your real INR or fake INR, and then they adjusted your real Coumadin or your fake Coumadin because we have to pretend that this is all legit and above board. So in these studies with millions of dollars and all the manpower in the world and people on you calling you to get this stuff done, make sure you're coming in for your appointments, make sure you're getting all this follow-up. The percent time that the INR was therapeutic, read it a different way. The percent time that Coumadin was working was 60% in most of these studies. So even when you put somebody on Coumadin, it's not really working very well. Now, change where you're at. Put yourself at Loyola, or frankly, any of the hospitals in the United States. Where do you think we're at for this? Oh, that's a little too cynical, but I appreciate where you're going. No, we're around 50%, right? That means that it certainly, when you put somebody on Coumadin, you've got a 50-50 chance that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Sometimes it's doing too much, sometimes it's doing too little. Only every once in a while is it Goldilocks and just right. Baby bear, I think. Okay. Now we like Domax in everything. We love it in AFib. We love it in treating clots. 
We don't love it in mechanical valves. Dome acts are no bueno for mechanical valves. We've studied them uh, in patients that they actually only studied dabigatran. They gave higher doses of dabigatran than what we give to people with AFib or people with clots. And they assessed to see if the people that got the higher dose were more likely to form clots or more likely to bleed. I'm giving you a higher dose of drug. I'm going to ask the audience, I'm giving you higher doses of dabigatran. How many people think the patients were more likely to bleed? Show of hands. Somebody brave. A few? Okay. How many people think the patients were more likely to clot? A few hands. Yeah. You're all right. They did all of it. They were more likely to bleed and clot than if you were on Coumadin. So we do not use dabigatran. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this is the trial. So look, I cited things. So you can actually go and read them. It's the realign trial. We're not going to focus on it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about bleeding. Remember I said it was equal. Coumadin and the DOAX have equal amounts of bleeding. And obviously, I wouldn't have this little section if it really was the same. Okay, so warfarin has several reversal agents, vitamin K, FFP. Initially, there were no reversal agents for DOAX, right? So they did this breakdown. They took all the different data from the RELY trials. So now we're looking... Um, at Rely only, this was the Dabigatran data, um, and they broke it down, and they said, okay, there's actually less intracranial bleeding with Dabigatran and less GI bleeding with Coumadin, and this actually held true across the other drugs as well. So I'm going to ask you right now, each of you has to have a major bleeding event in the next five minutes. Show of hands, who wants brain bleeds? Not even a smart ass in the group. Okay, no one put their hands up. Who would prefer to have a GI bleed? Yeah, you and everybody else. Okay. So uh, there's some more data. They found actually the people that did tend to bleed on dabigatran also tended to be older than people that bled on Coumadin. Um, and they actually tended to have worse kidney function. So they tended to be sicker people that were bleeding on dabigatran than Coumadin. They're also more likely in this study to have been on uh, aspirin or an NSAID. Uh, we don't really care about all that. We're going to skip through it. Anyway, what it boiled down to when they looked at all the different data from these studies was DOAX had more GI bleeding and Coumadin has more spontaneous intracranial bleeding. And obviously we would all prefer GI bleeding, right? There's not a great reason why. The assumption is that DOAX act locally in a stronger fashion than Coumadin does. They're absorbed in the GI tract, you're gonna bleed in the GI tract because there's just more of an effect right there, okay? Um, this was interesting. They actually looked at intracranial hemorrhage mortality in people on Coumadin and people on dabigatran. And again, at the time, there was no reversal agent for dabigatran when they looked at this data. So you could still reverse Coumadin, you couldn't reverse dabigatran. And what they found was um, there was no significant mortality increase in the dabigatran patients. So you were on dabigatran, I couldn't reverse it, but you were still about as likely to die as a Coumadin patient, right? So I asked Vic Prabhu, who's had the opportunity in their short time here at Loyola to talk to Dr. Prabhu? Anybody, right? I used to say Dr. Prabhu is a very nice man for a neurosurgeon. That is an insult. Dr. Prabhu is a very nice man for a family medicine slash pediatrician. Dr. Prabhu is a very nice man. He's just wonderful. I said, Dr. Prabhu, what do you recommend then for people that are on these drugs if the mortality is the same? And he said, don't hit your head. He's like, if you're on one of these drugs, just don't hit your head. It's the best you can do. Okay. Take it. It's from a neurosurgeon. Oh, all right. Let's go through the reversal stuff a little bit. So just take my word for it. Doax are better for bleeding, at least in the bleeding that, that we care about the most. Does this one still work? Thank you. I got some chuckles out of this. Okay, again, you are all young in your lives as physicians. And yet, even at this point, some of you have probably heard from surgery, hey, that INR is a little high. Give them some FFP tonight, check an INR. Give them some FFP in the morning, check another INR. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. It makes no sense. How long does FFP last, the effect of FFP? four to six hours, four to six hours. And yet this still percolates through surgery. And I've given this lecture to surgeons and it doesn't matter. They still say it. Surgeons I respect 
right? Smart people. Give them some FFP tonight. Why? Just open it up and pour it on the floor, <laughs> right? They get the same effect in a few hours, and I'm not giving them a blood product. Just don't slip in it. Okay, so Coumadin reversal, VKA reversal. Um, it depends on what you're looking for. There's three types of vitamin K that we're going to use for reversal agents. There is oral, there is subcutaneous, and there is IV, okay? When I was a resident, I swear I would never be the person to say things like this. When I was a resident, load these many years ago, IV formulations of vitamin K caused anaphylaxis. So if you ordered IV vitamin K, pharmacy would call you and say, you meant sub-Q, right? You'd be like, oh my God, thanks. Absolutely, of course, sub-Q. Sub-Q and oral, that's what we gave. These days, we don't have that problem. The IV formulations of vitamin K work just fine. So now if you order sub-Q vitamin K, pharmacy will call and be like, you meant IV, right? You're like, oh my God, yes. Unless you're on the liver service. In which case you bang your head on the floor and say, nope, this is what they want for reasons that aren't supported by any medical literature. But you're going to find yourself doing that a lot when you're on the liver service. <laughs> you can tell them I said that. Um, so there's a couple of different types of vitamin K. We're going to focus on oral and we're going to focus on IV. Which one do you think works faster? IV. IV vitamin K works pretty fast. So most of the stuff that we're going to deal with in the hospital, especially in our patients that have hip fractures where they have to get to the OR pretty quickly. We know every 24 hours that a patient has a hip fracture that we're delaying surgery, that's an increase in mortality, right? So we want to get them to the OR as quickly as possible. So you give them IV vitamin K, it works in about eight hours. As long as their INR is not crazy high, one dose of five milligrams or 10 milligrams of IV vitamin K will actually get that Coumadin level down pretty well for surgery the next day. Oral vitamin K, we're going to re uh, reserve that for non-bleeding people whose INRs are a little too high. So when that person comes in, and their INR, I think Loyola's guidelines, somebody correct me, but don't, because I'm an attending. I think is if it's over six, we're gonna give oral. If it's under six, we just kind of let it ride and it'll go down on its own. But if it's over six, we're gonna give oral vitamin K. So 2.5 or five uh, oral vitamin K, we'll pull, that, uh, we'll pull that INR down. So then we get into the blood products. We have FFP, we have cryoprecipitate, cryoprecipitate. And we have things called factor concentrates. Has anybody ever seen or used K-Centra? K-Centra is pretty badass. It's like a real concentrated form of FFP. It's just down to the good stuff. The mistake people make is thinking it's not a blood product. We have had people come in, especially Jehovah's Witnesses, that we need to reverse things on. And people think, oh, K-Centra, it's not a blood product. It is a blood product. So you shouldn't use it in people that are averse to getting blood products. So what do we like about K-Centra is there's no ABO incompatibility. Uh, it's a very small volume. It's not frozen. Um, it's at least as effective in FFP and reversing VKs. It's actually hard to find. And by that, I mean, literally, our pharmacy loses it all the time. When my wife was in charge of our pharmacy, that was the number one call she would get. Oh my God, where's the K-Centra? And she's like, when she's talking to our children, where did you have it last? And then they would inevitably find it in the IV room or something. So FFP works really well. Uh, it works right away when you start it. It works as long as you're running it, and it'll give you four to six hours afterwards, right? If your INR is 2.5 before surgery, and I give you FFP, in 10 hours, your INR is going to be around 2.5 again. It's not going to fix it. It'll fix it during the time that you're giving it, and then it's not going to do as much later. Um, let me see if it comes up here in a second. So again, K-Centra, there's something called COFACT. That's the other prothrombin complex concentrate. Um, you'll see us give this uh, for dabigatran. You'll actually see us give cryo and FFP and things like that for any of the DOACs. They actually don't do anything, but it's about all we have. So we will give it sometimes. Oh, we don't care about that. So um, when we're talking about FFP, the thing to recognize about FFP when it comes to Coumadin is it's how high your INR is, is how much bang for your buck you get, right? So for my couple of seniors in the room, what is the INR necessary for IR to perform a procedure? What do they usually ask you for? Give me an INR of 1.5. Some of them are getting more liberal and actually some surgeons the musculoskeletal guys, the, the not IR guys, but the ones that are just putting needles in like thighs and stuff, they'll do it on almost anything. Those guys are mavericks. But INR, IR usually wants 1.5. Now the difference between 1.5 and 1.7 is 
nothing. There's really no bleeding difference. But you will find yourself at some point in your career sitting there thinking, I'm going to make the argument. I'm not giving FFP. This is a waste of time. And you will spend several hours arguing with IR that you're not going to give FFP for that INR of 1.8. And then your patient will not get the procedure and you will feel bad about yourself. And then the next time it comes up, you'll snip that little bit of your soul off and you'll give a couple units of FFP and send them down to the procedure. Because at some point you just need to get some things done. If your INR is two or under, FFP is not going to do much for you. FFP actually has its own INR, which is around 1.5. Just think of it as simple physics or dilutions or mixing things. If I'm giving you something with an INR of 1.5 and your INR is already 1.7, we're not getting a whole lot there, right? If your INR is five or six, FFP makes a big difference. The farther or higher your INR is above two, the more bang for the buck you get out of your FFP, right? The closer it is to two or under, it gets almost nothing for it. So uh, Praxbind, if you really want to try and say the real name, it's Indarosuzumab. This is our bonding agent for dabigatran. Um, it's a monoclonal antibody. It binds the bigger trend with a 350 time greater affinity than the thrombin. So you give this, it binds up all the bigger trend that's in there before it can bind to the thrombin. Uh, so the reverse ADs, uncontrolled life-threatening bleeding. This is the sort of stuff where they didn't have, you know, randomized control trials. They just said, people are bleeding, they're on it. Let's give it and see if it works. And they find it actually worked pretty well. I don't want to spend a lot of time agonizing over that. So, and next in the alpha, it's the same thing. It's a decoy protein that binds up all of your DOEX with more affinity um, than uh, factor 10A. Okay. That is legit. That's the end. That's all I have. So questions. Yes. Please. So it depends on what you're giving it for, right? If someone's bleeding and their INR is over two, FFP just because you have to. It's the only thing you have that's going to work real fast and get it down. If you're trying to go for a procedure and your INR is 1.8, 1.7, you can give it. It's a security blanket for the IR doctors, for the surgeons, because they think, oh, you've given me something that's going to protect me. But in reality, it's not doing anything, right? If your INR is three, it'll do it. It'll, it'll get you down. It just, you know, what are we giving it for? We're not going to give FFP for an INR of three if it's just nothing else going. If they're not going to surgery and they're not bleeding, you don't need it, right? Um, but if they're getting surgery like the next day, the pain doesn't like Yeah, giving FFP that night doesn't do anything. It's gone, right? So the argument would be give vitamin K tonight because you have some time. In the morning, if that INR is still too high, then we give the FFP, right? Because that night, an INR of 2.8, I can give you some IV vitamin K and get you down in the morning. The FFP does nothing other than exposes them to ABO incompatibilities and gives them tacos and trolleys and all the other weird acronyms that those guys come up with. So giving it at night does nothing. You give it in the morning if you're going to give it. So in general, if you're giving it, we like to run it. We've actually had voice reports. We And I encourage all of you to voice report this if it happens. If you talk to IR, if you talk to surgery, and they say, we're going to take the patient at 10 o'clock, have the FFP running, which is what you should do, have it running as they're going down. And then they bump the surgery. They delay the surgery until the afternoon. That FFP is gone. You've exposed them to a blood product. You've given them no benefit for it. And you're going to have to give them more. Because that two units of FFP or whatever you just gave them, that's out of their system by four o'clock when they take it. You have to do it again. So voice report that. That's a waste of time. That's, a, that's dangerous for the patient. So we voice report those. Yeah, there's a question. So you know, sometimes after the reversal of INR, it goes down to 1.1, 1, 1.2. There's a desire to get it out quickly. It's like a cardiology that's causing yeah. high bottom And then, you know, the cardiology will be like, oh, don't get too much vitamin K or vitamin yeah. K. That's a, it's a great point. I'm actually, I'm really glad you brought it up almost as if I planted him in the audience to do it, which I very much did not. Um, 
there's actually really good data. There's studies out there on this. And we are very inpatient, right? Especially in the hospital, right? Impatient as inpatient. See what I did there, Magda? So clever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that, but that, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what happens is you reverse them to get them down so they can go to a procedure and then they are Coumadin hostages again, right? Because they're on Coumadin for a reason. Presumably you can't switch them to something else. They're on that Coumadin. If you can just give them Lovenox, you can throw them out the door on Lovenox and just keep following. It's the ones that are going to be the Coumadin hostages. Also, you can call them pharmacy failures. Not around your spouse if they're a pharmacist though, but pharmacy failure is acceptable. Um, there was a, a school of thought when I was in medical school that we would do Coumadin loading, which was wild. You give them like 20 of PO Coumadin, then 10, then five, all kinds of crazy stuff was happening. So that's why there's a order per PharmD because if you let doctors do it, we do obnoxious stuff to patients and the pharmacist will have the patients do it. There's actually data that said, if you reverse somebody down to 1.1, they followed up and they asked, if I were to ask you guys, somebody comes in, INR3, I got to do a procedure, I reverse them down to one and they have clotting problems, okay? Are they more likely to bleed or clot once I reverse them in the long haul? Show of hands, who thinks they're more likely to bleed? Who thinks they're more likely to clot? I reverse them. Clot, that would make sense. It's wrong though. They're actually more likely to bleed because of specifically what you pointed out. We reverse them, we've gotten them down, we've done our procedure, and then we are so impatient to get them back up that they come in on a 3.5 milligrams of Coumadin. We send them home on eight because we need to get it up. And that's what it took. So they go home on dramatically higher doses of Coumadin than what they came in on because it took that much to get them there. And then they get that INR of seven or eight in a month. So it's really, it's just patience. There's no real better way of doing it. Don't hit them with 10 of IV when five will do the trick. Um, same with, you can give them 2.5 to get it down just a smidge. So, and, and again, depending on how much time you have, you can give them a little, check it. It's not low enough, give them a little bit more. But if you slam them with 10 IV, that's in there. That's gonna, it's gonna take you a while to overcome that. So there's no better way of doing it, just being aware that once you reversed it, now you have to have patience. And I would take the gun out of your hand and give it to the pharmacist and make sure. Guys, don't order anything as primary to dose. Vanco should be dosed by pharmacists. Coumadin should be dosed by pharmacists. God, that's why they gave us those orders. If you put that in for you to dose, that's really going to be on you. Your attending's not going to be thrilled. That was a great question. More. Okay. Who's on GenMed right now? Okay. Who's got Dr. Kazi? Oh, isn't he the best? Who else is on with, uh, who's GenMed 2? Who's your attending? Is it? Oh, Neeraj, also the best. That's good. Who's, who's GenMed 3 right now? That guy? That guy. Dr. Santa is the meanest man that works in this hospital. Have you noticed that? Right? I mean, swears like a sailor, drinks like a fish. No, Dr. Santa is far and away the nicest man that works in this hospital. I've only heard him raise his voice one time and I was shocked. Shocked, I tell you. And it wasn't even when my Dr. Pepper exploded in his fridge and ruined his desk. <laughs> it was at GI, but that's not surprising to anybody. <laughs> Guys, I'm, for whatever reason, just by dint of being here the longest, I graduated from residency in 09. I've been a hospital here ever since. I, uh, if you ever need anything, whether it relates to residency and you have questions or Loyola or gosh, how do I survive or work-life balance, uh, or you want to be a hospitalist, God forbid, email me. Happy to help. Um, I love teaching. My day has sucked so far. First day on service, all kinds of administrative crap. Sorry, I try not to swear. Uh, this is, did I? Okay. Um, this, is, this is the best part of my day. I love teaching. I love doing this stuff. If you guys need anything, let me know. Oh, there's a chat. Because I did such a good job. Because I did such a good job. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs>